Hey, Misfits. I'm your host, Melinda. Thank you for joining Mystery Loves Company. Now hold on to your butts as we go on another mysterious adventure. Let's see what today has in store for us. Hey, Misfits. Melinda here. Today we have a mind bender for you and we will definitely leave you with more questions than answers on this one. Uh, This is an unsolved case that has many twists and turns. So many things that don't add up or make any sort of sense. And here we are 45 years later still scratching our heads. This story is also known as the American Dyatlov Pass as this is about a group of people that disappeared and there is still so many questions left unanswered. So, welcome to the story of the Yuba County Five. In 1978, five California men went missing. These men were Ted Weir, who was 32. He was described as an extremely friendly and outgoing person. He would stand outside and wave to people on the street, but if they didn't wave back, he would be completely heartbroken. Ted went to Marysville High School, where he was known as an average kid. The only thing that set him apart from the other kids is that he had a slight intellectual disability. Ted did have a job at a local snack bar at the time of his disappearance. Uh, Jackie Hewitt was 24 years old. He was described as being slow in the head in work and professional settings. Ted and Jackie were really, really close. They spent a ton of time together, even though there was quite an age gap between the two. Jackie really admired and looked up to Ted like he was an older brother. Um, They they were extremely close, watched a ton of um, basketball games together, and like they just hung out really, really often. Bill Sterling, he was 29 years old. He was a very kind and generous person. He spent a lot of his time volunteering at mental hospitals. He would read to the patients and spend time with them. Bill was also known as a man of faith. He would bring the patients some religious text and read it to them because he loved to spread the word and share his faith with as many people as he possibly could. Uh, Jack Madruga was 30 years old. He was a U.S. Army vet that served in Vietnam. He had a slight mental disability but was very high functioning. Uh, He had his driver's license and his prized possession, which was a turquoise and white 1969 Mercury Montego. And this car was his baby. He took such, such good care of it. Uh, Jack and Bill were really, really close friends. All of these guys were super close friends, but Jack and Bill were really close to each other. And then there was Gary Mathias. He was 25 years old. He worked part-time at a landscaping company that his father owned as an assistant gardener. Gary served in the army and was discharged due to drug use, and he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Gary had been in and out of mental uh, health institutes, but at the time of his disappearance, he was being treated with antipsychotics and was said to have been doing very well. All five of these men were considered high functioning with their mental disabilities. Uh, These guys were from Yuba City, California, and they were always referred to as the boys by friends and family. The boys lived at home with their respective parents, but were independent, and some of them held jobs. All of these guys were major sports enthusiasts, especially with basketball. They all uh, hung out together very often, either playing or watching sports. It is said that they were pretty much inseparable. Uh, The boys grew a very strong bond through Gate Gators, which was a local sponsored program Um, basketball team for the mentally handicapped. And the boys had a basketball game on February 25th, 1978, that they were excited to play in. 
And this basketball game was organized by the Special Olympics. So the winning team would receive a free week-long trip to Los Angeles. And the boys were dead set on winning this. Uh, all of them had their jerseys laid out and everything ready for the next morning for their big game. And on the evening of February 24th, the boys drove 50 miles north to Chico, California, to watch a basketball game between UC Davis and Chico State. After the game, they stopped at a gas station to grab some snacks to celebrate the win of their favorite team, which was UC Davis. They were supposed to be back home that night after the game so they could finish getting ready for their, for their game the following day, but they never did arrive. When the boys didn't arrive home, uh, when they were supposed to be, all of the parents started to worry, and they all stayed up all night long waiting for them. The police were called, and the parents let the police know that they would not have missed their game in the morning for anything. Also, Hewitt did not like staying out late at night, and especially being out overnight. He was just really, really uncomfortable with it. Uh, so, the police began searching the route the Yuba County Five would have taken back from Chico, and there were no signs of the boys. This is when the whole case gets a little wonky and takes some mysterious turns. A ranger from the Plumas National Forest had told investigators he saw a Mercury Montego parked along one of the roads in the forest on February 25th. The ranger was not concerned because residents in the area parked on that road while spending the day cross-country skiing in the thick snow. Knowing that Madruga drove a Mercury Montego, the police went to investigate and found Madruga's car. Locals say that in order to get to this road, you had to do so purposefully. This isn't an area you just stumble upon accidentally. This is a dirt road in the mountains and is dangerous and sketchy, especially covered in snow. Nobody knew why his car was there or why the Yuba County Five were even in Plumas. Some of the boys' parents told police that there was no reason their sons would have gone that far into the mountains while it was snowing. The, uh, the forest was over 70 miles northeast of Chico, opposite the direction of returning home. The car was stuck in a snowdrift, showing no signs that the guys even tried to get the car out of the snowbank. However, the police felt that the five men who were in good health could have easily pushed the car out of a snowdrift. Uh, there were no keys found in the car, and when the police hotwired it, it worked without a problem and still had a quarter of a tank of gas. So it was very clear that there weren't any car troubles that caused them to pull over onto the side of the road and get out of the car. Uh, so it must have just been the fact that they were stuck in a snowbank. Uh, the Montego was examined and the undercarriage had zero dents or scratches, even though the terrain was rough. So whoever drove the car into the forest drove incredibly cautiously or knew the area well. And Madruga was always the driver of the group because he was the one with the driver's license and he was the one with the car. So nobody else would have been driving his car. But Madruga had never been to Plumas. He hated camping or any outdoor event that would make him cold or uncomfortable. And so a search began. There were many forest rangers, about 50 other people on snowmobiles, including Jackie Hewitt's father, and many others searching by foot. Unfortunately, snowstorms became so horrible that some of the search searchers almost became lost themselves, and it was becoming so dangerous that the weather caused the search to be closed two days later. But the police asked the public for any information related to the missing Yuba County Five, uh, the parents refused to quit searching, so they raised about $2,600 for a reward for any information on their sons. And they also reached out to a few psychics, but those became dead ends as well. <coughs> a man named Joseph Scones called the police and said that he had seen the five men on the Friday that they disappeared. 
Joseph states that he went up th- he went up there to scout out the area for a family trip he was planning when his car got stuck. While he was trying to push his car out of the snow, Joseph suffered a mild heart attack. So he got back in the car and turned on the heat trying to relax and stay calm. Uh, he was up there for about six hours when he saw headlights coming. He said he saw a pickup truck and when he called out for help, The truck shut their lights off and kept driving. Then he saw flashlight beams and a group of five men and a lady with a baby. A lady with a baby. Uh, He tried to call out to the men to ask them for help, but soon the men were gone as if they had completely ignored him. All the families of the Yuba Five agreed that it was uncharacteristic of them to not help Joseph when he called out for them. In fact, Weir went out of his way to get a stranger to a hospital at one point while this stranger suffered an overdose. At this point, if I were having a heart attack and I had called out to two different groups of people and they acted as if they didn't hear me, I would legit think I was dead. Like, why can't anybody hear me? I've had a heart attack. I've completely died. So I don't even know how this man was feeling, but that's exactly how I would feel at this point in time. But once uh, Joseph's pain had started to subside, he decided to walk the eight miles down the mountain in the snow and he passes the Montego on his way. There was another witness. Uh, She said she saw five men in a red pickup truck on Saturday and Sunday an hour from where the car was found. She told the police that two of the men came into her store to buy food and to use the phone, while the rest of the men stayed in the truck. This story didn't check out, though. Unfortunately, the story just ends here, until three months later. On June 4th, it was finally starting to get warm, and the snow was melting. A group of bikers were out for a ride and came across a closed-down Forest Service camp, and they immediately noticed a wretched, putrid smell. They said the smell was so overwhelming that it made them sick. They realized it was coming from a broken window on a Forest Service trailer, so they went back to town and they called 911. When the police got there, they found that the trailer was locked from the inside, Once inside the trailer, they found Ted Weir's body, still partially frozen, but starting to thaw out. They saw eight sheets over his body, but meticulously wrapped around different body parts as if if somebody had been doing some sort of strange ritual on him. Uh, Ted had been wearing leather boots when he disappeared, and his boots were never found. His ring, wallet, and necklace were on the bedside table next to him. When Ted went missing, he was close to 200 pounds, and when he was found, he was only 100 pounds. Another strange thing about this is the camp was 19.4 miles away from where the abandoned car was found. So, like, Ted walked 20 miles to this campsite? 20 freaking miles in the blistering snow? I'm not, I'm not completely sold on that. But um, his feet were, fost- were, bleh, were frostbitten and gangrenous. Uh, based on the length of his beard, the coroner was able to determine that Weir had lived as long as 8 to 13 weeks after he last shaved. The cause of death for Weir was determined to be hypothermia and starvation. Now, this was confusing because the trailer had a lot of matches and books for kindling, a butane tank for heat, heavy forestry snow clothing that was found unused. Uh, There were 12 army ration cans that were found on the floor and empty but there was an untouched dry food pantry with enough supplies to keep all of the Yuba County Five alive for a year or more. Weir's family told police he lacked common sense from his disability. They went on to explain an incident where he, where he had to be dragged from his bed 
while the ceiling was on fire. He said that he stayed in his bed because he was afraid he wouldn't get to work on time if he got up. So that would kind of explain why if he were in this camper or trailer, not camper, I'm sorry. If he were in this trailer alone, maybe he just stayed in the bed due to a lack of common sense. Like, I, I don't know. I can't, I'm just guessing on that. Um, but, but there was evidence that Weir was not alone in the trailer the whole time. Police believe that Matthias and maybe even Hewitt, who they had not found yet, were in the trailer with Weir. Matthias's shoes were found in the trailer, and it looked like the food cans that had been eaten were open with a military P-38 can opener, which only Madruga and Matthias would know how to operate this device from their time in the army. So on June 5th, the police had decided to backtrack and started searching along the road that led from the Montego to the trailer and found the scattered remains of Madruga and Sterling. These two were found 11 miles away from the car and they were on opposite sides of the road. Their bodies had been ripped apart and scattered by wildlife. Autopsies confirmed their death was caused by hypothermia. Authorities think that one of these two men had laid down to rest or sleep, which is a side effect of late stage hypothermia. And it seems the other one stayed with his friend until he too froze to death. Two days after Madruga and Sterling's remains were found, they found the remains of Jack Hewitt. Jackie's father had come across some of his son's clothes while he was out searching, and upon picking them up, Jackie's spine fell out onto the ground. His spine fell out of his empty t-shirt onto the ground. So, for the Yuba County Five, uh, four of the Yuba County Five tragically died in the forest. The real mystery is that Matthias was never found. We know he was in the trailer where he left his shoes, and it's assumed he took Weir's missing boots, um, which would have fit his frostbitten feet a bit better, but his remains have not been found after 45 years. So there's one theory um, that the boys may have taken a side trip to visit some friends of Matthias's in a nearby town. The thought was that Madruga took a wrong turn and kept going straight ahead instead of turning around. However, police discovered that Matthias's friends hadn't seen or heard from him in over a year. Now, Matthias, however, could have kept walking after Hewitt died and he was somewhere else. Matthias was known for being able to travel long distances on foot. He had once walked over 500 miles after, escape, after escaping the asylum he was staying at. With this in mind, police sent pictures of Matthias to the town hospital and morgue nearby, but nobody ever saw him. Matthias' mental health was brought up as a theory. Matthias was a paranoid schizophrenic and did not have his medication with him, which would have meant he began hallucinating and might have led the boys from the car in a deluded state. Jack Madruga's mother had told reporters there was some, there was some force that made them go up there. They, they wouldn't have fled off into the woods like a bunch of quail. We know good and well that somebody made them do it. While Weir's sister-in-law was quoted saying, they seen something at the game, in the parking lot. They may... They might have seen it and didn't even realize that they had seen it, which may have gotten them in some trouble and maybe they were chased up the mountain, but the car would have shown signs of this and there were none. Matthias's stepfather believed that the only reason why the men in the trailer didn't build a fire was that they were afraid of being found. This case can be summarized by Yuba County Sheriff at the time, Jack Beecham, who described it as bizarre as hell. Uh, some people believe that Matthias may have been responsible for this, and some people 
believe, believe that Matthias may have been weighted down with heavy objects and thrown over the Orville Dam, which is why his body was never found. Um, there are some that think that because of the mental disabilities that they made poor judgment calls on going up the mountain instead of turning back and um, going back to where civilization was. Some people think that there was definitely foul play. Um, it is also believed that a group of men were attacked by aliens and that Gary was abducted. Now, one of these men did have a sister with a baby and a boyfriend that was horrible. Not sure if this has anything to do with it, but there were a few mentions of a woman with a baby. But this part of the story is not spoken about much by anyone. Um, there, there are possible details that were not mentioned. Um, like there was baby clothes and blankets found inside the car and shell casings found near the car. These details can't be 100% confirmed as they were, were never released to the public. But with all of these things going on and all of these questions that are left, we would love to hear what your theories are or any questions that you might have regarding this case. Like I have, I have certain theories. Like I've thought about maybe, uh, maybe they did see something at the game and maybe they were, we'll say kidnapped. Like somebody got in their car and was driving this car, somebody who knew this road somebody who knew this area and they were driving them up this mountain. Now, I don't know much about a Montego and how many people it sits, but um, I do know that there was the five guys. And so adding an extra person to that, there would be six of them, right? Not sure if they would all fit, but I'm sure that they could be squeezed in somehow or another and then driven up the mountain to meet their fate. Um, that makes sense to me a little bit. Uh, I can kind of get behind the whole alien thing too. I love a good alien story, a good alien abduction story. But at the same time, like, why, why would Ted have lived 8 to 13 weeks starving to death in a trailer that's 20 miles away from the car? Like, if an alien's going to attack you, are they just going to hold you hostage and keep you in a trailer and make you starve to death? I don't know. I would think that it would be a little bit quicker than that. But who knows? Who am I? I'm just a girl doing a podcast. That's all I know. So if any of you have theories that you want to discuss or questions that you might have about this case, please let me know. You know that our email is mystery.loves.company.pod at gmail.com. So thank you guys for joining me again today and we will talk soon. Bye. Thanks for joining misfits. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. After all, mystery loves company.